Um, so today's event will be chaired by Gabriel. So I will just hand over to, to Gabriel now. And yeah, and if you have any questions during the event for our speakers, feel free to post in the chat and we will communicate that. Yes, uh, thank you so much. It's good to see some familiar faces in the audience. Those actually who know me from the GY457 lectures um, know that I very much like to um, see uh, video cameras on. That makes the whole experience a little bit more interactive on our side. So if you don't mind, I'd appreciate if um, you would show your faces. If not, of course, we um, are very happy to respect that. So the idea of this um, event, I think, is to kind of yeah talk. And by talk, I really mean talk a little bit about uh, as we thought what would be the legacy of the pandemic. Um, I think we came to realize that actually we're not really talking about the legacy, but we are still in the middle of it. And the format that we have in mind is that we have distinguished uh, academics and um, by distinguished academics, I uh, exclude myself, at least I try, right? Um, uh, uh, talking about uh, um, the uh, current pandemics and the implications of property markets. So we have chosen our speakers with respect to their um, expertise, and just for um, those of you who aren't fully aware, let me just kind of briefly mention that all of the three speakers, Lindsay, uh, Paul, and Henry, they have done um, excellent work on uh, the pandemic and potential effects on housing markets. They will introduce these ideas briefly. But um, just to kind of point out that Lindsay is our leading expert in the Reef Group when it comes to retailing and especially online retailing, and she's currently doing research on how um, the pandemic is shifting consumption patterns on retail markets, which I think is a super exciting topic. Everybody who knows Paul knows that Paul is always at the forefront of research when it comes to British housing markets. So no surprise, he's done research to uh, think about how the pandemic so far has shifted demand and supply, particular demand on British housing markets. And Henry Overman, in his various roles as research director of CEP and the director of the World Work Center of Local Economic Growth, he has written a very kind of um, influential piece asking the provocative question if um, the pandemic could lead to a big city exodus. And um, uh, so they're all very qualified. I try to uh, put myself into um, the role of a moderator, um, uh, no matter how difficult this is for me. Um, and I will first ask our three um, presenters in the order, Lindsay, Paul and Henry to have brief opening statements, right? Just kind of uh, share on a very high level, the perception of uh, the impact the pandemic might have on um, cities and housing markets and property markets more generally. And then we move on to a panel discussion. And the audience is invited to um, contribute by asking questions in the chat box. Uh, Lois will um, monitor the chat box so that we can also bring um, you guys on board. With this, I hand over to Lindsay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak um, today on this panel. Um, so during the pandemic, I've been doing a lot of research, as Gabriel said, on the effects of um, the various restrictions on uh, consumers retailing behaviors, how they shop in their local offline economies and online. During the pandemic itself, I spent um, quite a bit of effort on helping uh, JP Morgan Chase and cities across the country understand how bank data could be used in real time to measure the impacts of the pandemic on their local economies. And um, since that project has um, wrapped up, what I've been focused on mostly is the effects of the transition um, of consumers' online shopping behaviors to a more permanent um, and persistent shock than just the initial um, pandemic shock that, that sort of forced people to go online. But now that those behaviors have become more ingrained, you know, how is that persistence going to play out um, in retail markets as things continue? So um, what I have observed in the data is that the uh, a major lesson uh, across cities in the US at least is that uh, it hasn't really been the case that individual localized experiences of COVID deaths or case rates um, are driving local responses to the pandemic, but rather the national uh, sentiment about how the pandemic is going is really driving people in and out uh, of shops. So when um, it seems like national uh, COVID restrictions or national case rates or death rates are really high, then people tend to stay more home rather than sort of relying on sort of their very localized life me measures. And the lesson for that um, for me has really been that, um, you know, the economy is not going to uh, come back to the way it was in terms of retail markets until we have a more national handle on the on the pandemic. Now, um, on the online side, right, the persistence of these um, new shopping behaviors suggest a more permanent shift towards online retail in the future going forward, like a level shift 
and how much of our economy takes place online. Now that's going to have important implications for sort of the accelerating retail ap apocalypse in some uh, retailers, things like clothing stores and bookstores, which have uh, traditionally been you know, decimated already. But my research shows that um, it's not just a story of a retail apocalypse, but rather that um, other stores eventually might be able to benefit from this shift in the long run, particularly services, right, which have been most uh, harmed during the pandemic, might actually benefit in the long run once we reach a more endemic state in which consumers are doing more uh, shopping online and so they have time to do other things um, in the offline economy. So I think that's my, my real take is that uh, services in the long run will actually um, come out uh, doing well and that uh, the redistribution of economic activity that's driven by online uh, retail will um, shift that concentration away from sort of inner cores towards um, a more even distribution across space. <laughs> okay, that's a bold statement. We're gonna see a reversion of uh, the trends of spatial concentrations um, owing to the pandemic. Um, Paul, do you wanna um, jump on the train here, please? Hope you're on mute. Uh, I will unmute myself finally. Um, so back in March 2021, six months ago, uh, Christian Hilber, another former director of Reef and I, uh, published a CEP analysis, COVID analysis, uh, looking at the housing market. And I wouldn't hugely revise uh, what we found in that or argued would happen in that. Um, and the first, I think, fundamental point I'd make is we can all go away and not worry, uh, <laughs> exaggerate. Uh, that is, you know, we should not be fixated on the short-term shock of a pandemic. Yes, it's having big effects and people tend to project those effects into the distant future as if the whole world has changed. But we only have to look at history to see that this has happened many times before. And indeed it's happened far, far worse so if we take London, for example, in 1665, there was the Great Plague. Now that didn't kill 1% of the population of London, that killed 25 to 30% of the population of London in an 18 month period. And the following year, 1666, there was the Great Fire of London. Something like 90% of the houses in the city of London burnt down during that fire. And this fire spread out towards uh, uh, Whitehall as well. So you had two years of cataclysmic disaster in London. And 20 years later, the population of London was about 15% greater than it had been before the Black Death. Cities recover, housing markets recover. Uh, and we, we, you know, the same is true of the, of the, of the pre last great pandemic, the Spanish flu in 1918, 1921. 20, uh, it was far more, more, caused much more mortality than COVID, but not only did cities recover, they actually prospered in the, in the aftermath. So yes, there are changes now. And what Kristen and I uh, found uh, together with Oliver was that the immediate effect was, of course, a disaster and was a, a downturn in rents in London. The most badly affected uh, were the young people, people working in the gig economy who tended to be renters. So in central London, rents fell and there was an out, a movement out to more space further out. But the interesting thing is that the biggest increase in house prices in the aftermath of the onset of COVID in London was not uh, in house prices 30 miles out, but it was actually for very large houses within five miles of the center. So what you appeared to be observing was that the really very rich, and in London there are some very rich people, were sort of anticipating already the recovery of London's housing market, but were wanting to get more space and closer to the center. So really, I would argue that Yes, there are underlying changes that have been going on. More homeworking started before the pandemic. There's been a long-term demand for more space as incomes rise. People want bigger houses. So the demand for space in housing has been rising and that was accentuated in the short time by, uh, by COVID. But uh, to come back to it, so pre-trends may have been accelerated, uh, but as we said in the CEP analysis, uh, history and urban economics tell us 
that the long-term outlook for cities, including their housing markets, is pretty good. I rest my case. Thank, thank you very much, Paul. And I promise you guys, this has not been scripted. It's, this is just what happens when you put a couple of academics in the room. One academic says something, and the other one is almost predictably saying exactly the opposite. So we have Lindsay, who is making a strong <laughs> statement. But um, we have a re re disruptive. Wait, wait, wait. I'm describe. not saying there's like a death of cities. I'm talking more about a balance between the center and more suburban yes, areas. Of course, I'm exaggerating, right? I mean, so you, you, you're kind of uh, <laughs> laying out the mild uh, uh, trends towards dispersion, whereas uh, Paul is just going to say that actually we are very resilient here. Let's let's gather uh, Henry's view and see whether he sits somewhere in the middle or um, has a, st a strong view one way or the other. No, I sit somewhere in the middle. <clears throat> um, I mean, I, I, you, you, here is the message I give to ministers and senior officials, you know, who are asking about this a lot. Um, there's just huge uncertainty and very large option value to waiting uh, in terms of any uh, major decisions that, that we're going to make. So, um, you know, I, I think things are highly uncertain. I think, actually, I, I think Paul and Lindsay kind of agreed. Uh, here's, here's my sort of middle ground take on some of this. Um, I mean, where the, but I think Lindsay was talking about the pandemic having accelerated an ongoing structural shift. And, you know, that, I think Paul said that as well. And that, and that seems to me quite reasonable, uh, you know, something that I, I maybe am slightly more certain about and that I would take as a reasonably central projection. You know, so where, where, where it's accelerated ongoing structural shifts and retail really does seem to me that, you know, the shift to online, we've seen as much shift to online uh, in the year as we've seen in the decade, but, it, it, you know, so the, the trend's really accelerated. Then I think, you know, I, I'm reasonably comfortable in uh, suggesting that, you know, that, that one might stick. Where I'm with Paul uh, is that, uh, but I suspect Lindsay agrees here as well, is that, um, I'm much more uncertain about it shifting, you know, shifting us to a completely different equilibrium. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, suddenly going from a world where we've been seeing certain cities doing pretty well, and that seems to be, you know, falling transaction costs, falling communication costs, boosting those cities, boosting the commercial market in those cities, pulling in, you know, high skilled firms and high skilled workers. It seems a bold prediction to me that we're suddenly going to see that completely reversed. Um, having said that, I think the one big difference uh, with, with the examples that, that Paul uh, has talked about is that it, it, it is at least feasible um, that a large shock at the moment could move us to a new uh, equilibrium where lots of firms are uh, employing more remote working. Uh, and I think that if lots of firms employ more remote working, you know, that then suggests some slightly, you know, that then means that we do need to think about the scenarios. Interestingly, though, I still would sort of end up on a middle ground here, which is I still think some sitters will be absolutely fine if that happens. Um, I think the question then becomes which cities will do well and which cities will do badly. So there you go. That's my sort of slightly, uh, my sort of in-between take. Really big option value to waiting. I think I agree with Lindsay on the structural shift. I, I mostly agree with Paul, actually, that, you know, I, I don't think this undermines, you know, the whole big city story and success. I do wonder whether it could be terribly bad news for some cities uh, as, we, as we go. The one final thing I'd say, by the way, is that although I think there's lots of uncertainty, hopefully something that will come out in the discussions that we have here is I do think economics allows us to um, at least put some sort of probabilities uh, on, on what we think is likely and unlikely. There's some stuff being talked about that I just think the basic economics and evidence that we have tells us is never going to happen. Um, and I think it will be interesting to explore uh, what we think those are. All right. Thank you uh, for these uh, opening statements. I think we have two two routes to, um, uh, to pursue during this conversation. The, the one is definitely what Henry just said. I mean, some of the uh, uh, bold claims that are out there need to be dismissed. Um, uh, um, the other one is we probably do want to have a slightly more nuanced understanding of whether our cities are going to be um, uh, negatively affected by the pandemic or not. I think in, in my mind, if I, if I think about why cities exist, right? I mean, we have these 
We have these different concentration forces. One really comes from agglomeration economies, the production side. The other one might be related to um, the classic form of retailing that you have to uh, gather on the high street to get access to certain type of products. And then there's probably something um, a little bit more in the air, which is often referred to consumption amenities, which sounds a little bit like what, what Henry has in mind when he says that some cities will um, uh, do well no matter uh, what happens because they are just genuinely uh, more attractive. So can you can you just kind of share your thoughts a little bit um, with respect to these uh, three different type of agglomeration forces, um, uh, how they are going to be affected by uh, the pandemic and how this will change the future of cities very specifically. I understand from what I've heard so far that retail, probably the classic form of retailing, there we have a structural transformation. Is that going to be a threat for cities? Yes or no? Um, well, I think it's strongly transforming what exactly the source of those consumption amenities are, right? So you're not going to be um, putting in your downtown areas uh, lots of the kinds of activities that are that have been easily to move online, right? So you know the uh, and you might have a lot of dispersion, right, of restaurants more towards um, locations where people are going to be spending more of their time if they're working from home, right? This could be people who are remote fully, but it could also be people who are only going to the office two days a week, right? And so why would you have so many Costas, right, or Starbucks located so centrally downtown if you're trying to reach a workforce that's more dispersed through the city? But, you know, the, the sorts of retail that's really um, robust to that kind of competition includes like, you know, hair salons, nail salons, theaters, gyms, all these sorts of things that you really need to do in person. And so if you want to bring people to downtown, if you want to have people working downtown, right, the more you bring those kinds of um, in-person experiences, Things that people want to use to socialize, right? Clubs, uh, you know, other kinds of, uh, you know, music venues, that kinds of thing. That should be the more of the source of what of what draws people to the downtown areas, rather than sort of like a workforce based uh, like offering for for retailing. Can I jump in on that, Gabriel? So. Um... I think uh, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, what, what I, I think what's really interesting is what we're seeing on the footfall data for the UK. Uh, and I'm interested in people, if people on the, the call have insights about where we might go. So, um, you know, specifically on the retail, uh, what we're seeing is the following. Weekend footfall is basically recovered. So, you know, the, the centre for cities is the, it has the best uh, sort of data on this. Uh, monitoring footfall, weekend is pretty well back. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, week, week, uh, weekday evening is really uh, mostly back. Uh, uh, the only exception to that is in the real central business district. And there, it's just the fact that the weekday activity, uh, the weekday is really down. And there's obviously some part of the weekday evening that comes from the weekday. Uh, and that those footfall numbers are really down. Uh, I know that you know there are some alumni on the call. You would really be shocked at the number of boarded up, you know, shops etc. around uh, Alice and Holborn. You know, for those of you who remember it as a sort of big busting place. So I, I do think that um, you know it, now, and those nighttime and weekend are clearly about socialising and other things that you just can't do online, which is, I think, why, why I'm sort of in agreement with Lindsay. I, I do think that uh, it is really fascinating that the non-traded service provision, basically restaurants, hospitality, et cetera, that serve the office market are, are still really, really down. And that was pre-Omicron. I mean, those numbers that I'm talking about, the week, the weekday recovery numbers were back in September in the UK. And, you know, and as most of you know, we had Freedom Day in inverted commas by that point, and we were all out busy, sort of allowed to be back in the office. Um, so I think there's a real distinction here between the stuff that is reliant on commercial, which is still way down, and the stuff which is to do with the other amenity benefits that cities bring, which seems actually to have recovered remarkably well. Yes, I mean, I, just coming on that, um, I, I agree with that. And I was looking at football figures yesterday and also ridership on the London transport system yesterday. And, uh, you know, we, we opened up in, in May, late May, I think. The restrictions were lifted, but there was still some nervousness and restrictions. And uh, ridership on, on London transport uh, went back up to 70% from 56% pre uh, from the, the immediate hit of the, of the pandemic. So it was rising quite rapidly. But as Henry says, it was down in the very centre. 
And the idea of sort of three days in the office and two days at home is probably going to be increasingly uh, significant, and that will affect the other add-on effect in activities in the real center of cities. But on the other hand, you still require the offices. There's still a healthy demand for office space in, in, in even central London. And the ring around the center, uh, footfall was, as Henry's actually above the pre-pandemic uh, uh, 2020 level. Uh, so ridership was going up very rapidly when, when restrictions were lifted. But in addition, whilst we observed this fall in rents uh, in, in central London, uh, immediately following the the uh, the closure in 2020. In fact, over the last six months, it's rents, rents in central London that have been rising fastest and faster than in the rest of the country. Uh, so I think we- Is this office rents, Paul? I'm sorry? No, this is- Is this office rents? No, my, my job is housing. Uh, so this is housing. Ah, okay, uh, distinctions. Yep. <laughs> I, I haven't <laughs> looked at, I didn't look at office rents, but I have noticed a, a significant uh, uh, transactions in the cap in offices with quite premium prices being paid for them over the last two or three months in central London. Which I think is interesting. I think the area where we may really see a step change is in uh, business travel, because there I think people really have learned that you can do things on Zoom uh, that, that is really cheap compared to business travel. And one of the, the sector of London that's been worst hit is the airport sector and the whole of West London, which is tremendously influenced by Heathrow, that you can see that in the maps of unemployment and, uh, and house prices, but that's the area that's been most hit there and also around Gatwick. Now, I was looking at office uh, vacancies yesterday uh, in the US and uh, to sort of bolster my, bolster my point about the, the differences in the um, competitive advantages of, of center versus more suburban areas that the, the the gap between vacancy rates in downtowns versus the suburbs, which is, you know, vacancies in downtowns are normally much, much lower, has actually been at its most narrow point, um, you know, in the last several decades, right? So like the office vacancies are, are rising in, in central cities in the US and converging with what's happening in the suburbs, which I think is, you know, pushing firms, or flex firms pushing to sort of think about, do I need as much downtown retail? And I think, you know, sort of the, plain nondescript office boxes that don't have anything to offer workers in terms of uh, amenities or, or good spaces for interaction are really going to be be hurt and you're going to see a, a more dispersion of, of office space um, uh, out of the, the the very downtown. So am I right in, in, in collecting your views that there is a kind of strong sentiment that local non-tradables can only be provided in big cities. And this is probably because you need a certain mass of people so that variety pays off. But then while if, if I take, if you, if you push this thought, right? I mean, that means that big cities, at least those with reasonable fundamentals, they are going to survive as very attractive places because only these places can offer these uh, local non-tradables like bars, restaurants, movie theaters, and these kind of things. But then it's not so clear whether the core periphery structure within the city as we know it is going to survive. I mean, is that what I'm, what I'm hearing that, um, Lindsay, you're essentially saying that, I mean, there was a pull towards the center for these, uh, uh, towards the center for these local non-tradable amenities because they had to be close to where people are working. Now there is an incentive for these amenities to move to the places where people are living. And with this, they're going to um, uh, carry with them people who enjoy these amenities. If that was true, then we could see a significant reversal of this, this, this gentrification trend that we've seen in downtown areas. Am I collecting your thoughts correctly on this? I think that's broadly right, that there's gonna be some um, reversal of this like pressure of everything being right downtown and the things that are really work-based, right? In terms of what kind of consumption menus are, are there are not gonna be as, as pressured to be there. Um, so I think that I think that's right, but I'm not saying anything about like the destruction of cities. I think Paul is right when he sort of looks to his sort of history to tell us these lessons about even huge technological shifts like the telegraph or the telephone or the internet, right? All you know, there's been predictions, you know, for for hundreds of years of the death of the city, right? And all all that those celebrations have done is is push people closer together. And I think that's still right. It's just that you know, what what the basis for those uh, things to get together are is definitely going to shift. And so the pressure that's coming from, you know, workplace amenities all, all being downtown is, is going to, to ease. Yeah, I get, I, I, I would, oh, go, uh, 
I, I would actually, I'm going to sound a bit like Paul here. The, 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 the one thing that, so let me bring a bit of the economics in here, which is that I do think the nature of these predictions depends on supply elasticity in the housing and commercial markets. Um, you know, so that's one thing I would say. Uh, so here is the story that I tell when UK politicians ask me. In the UK, any prediction that involves large scale changes in the population structure of our cities is clearly wrong. And that is quite simply because we don't build houses. <laughs> I mean, the Paul's been saying this for ages, right? You know, so I see these things about how, you know, uh, we're going to see huge outflow to the countryside, right? So I've seen, well, you know, if you go and look at the vacancy data in, say, Cumbria, which is a reasonably remote uh, uh, region in the northwest, I think the long-term vacancy numbers are like 150, 200 properties. So, I mean, you can't see large population shifts. So, um, the now, it's somewhere in like in the US, this could be very different, right? I mean, the, the US could see very large supply responses uh, in, in, uh, to sort of the demand shifts that we're going to see. So I think, you know, it depends which of those worlds you're in uh, will matter quite a bit for some of these projections. Coming to your core periphery then, I, I sort of say two things on this. Uh, again, I'm sort of very much in the UK context. You, you see, I think the core periphery response could be larger in Lindsay's US cities, precisely because the supply could respond both on the commercial and the residential side to the underlying shift in preferences. Now, that won't happen in the UK. Paul's pretty well demonstrated this in both his work on commercial uh, and Christian's work on, on residential. But the thing that you could definitely see then is that shifts in demand have to come through the price side of the market, right? Uh, and so I do think that the thing we could see is quite large uh, demographic shifts. You know, people like me who really, you know, you see, I've got a nice kind of setup here. I can even turn around, play my hi-fi, you know, a little bit on the piano. It's all kind of nice. I don't really need to be in more than a couple of days a week. The, the value to us of these more peripheral locations has just really gone up, right? So you could really see that being reflected in the price prices in neighborhoods. So within the cities, you'd expect places that are not necessarily great access to the core, uh, but reasonable access to get you in a couple of days a week, uh, you know, you're going to see relative uh, price shifts that will uh, benefit those neighbourhoods. So I think there's two things that I would bring in there. I think I, I, I think the answer a little bit depends on on supply, uh, and if you're living in the world where we are, where supply, we know supply is inelastic, then you've got to be thinking price adjustments and what that implies. If you're in Lindsay's world, you're going to get a bit more of a mix of price adjustments and quantity adjustments. And I think that could make the pictures look not totally different, but somewhat different. Uh, just to come in there, I mean, I think that Lindsay doesn't live in a homogeneous world. I don't know if you would agree with me, uh, Lindsay. I mean, the East Coast and the West Coast are very different from the Midwest. I mean, the Midwest, you really have very uh, elastic supply of housing, and then you can see a much more, and you already have much more spread out cities with less obvious sort of central uh, consumption districts. Uh, so, so, but I agree with Henry. I mean, in, in Britain, to decentralize from London, you have to go maybe two hours uh, in terms of commuting. So that's four hours of commuting a day to get across the green belt around London because it's so huge. Uh, and this is why I, I remarked right at the beginning that what we observed at the beginning of the, in the early stages of the pandemic was actually by far the biggest proportional increase in house prices was for large houses in central London, not out there in the sticks, because people were wanting space, but they were wanting it still within reach of where they knew they would have to be, if not now, then pretty soon. Uh, and the other point I'd add to what Henry was saying, it's not just a question of supply elasticities, it's also a question of income elasticities of demand. And we've known for a long time, there's a very strong income elasticity of demand for space in housing, which of course is complementary to home working. But in addition, I think that there is a, where we don't have such good evidence, that there is a strong income elasticity of demand for the sort of non-tradable, uh, features of cities which make them places where you can have a much higher quality of consumption so you can go to the theater you can go to the restaurants you can go to the 
the, the, the sports events or the big concerts or whatever it may be. And that requires big audiences. And that is, a, is something for which there is a strong income elasticity of demand, which I think will continue. And I think that was one of the factors which was driving the centralization of population, the gentrification, if you like, of population in the 2000s but i think it's not gone away and so whilst there are the points that uh, have been made uh, about why we'll, why we'll get more home working which i agree with uh, nevertheless cities will still have an attraction and the center of cities will still have an attraction but maybe not the uh, the business districts the central business districts to quite the extent that they did have Yeah, so picking picking on that, I mean, the, so so Henry has started to think about demand and supply, which is obviously the right direction to go. Now, um, still, it feels like we can go one step further, right? I mean, there seems to be an agreement that demand is in in the first step shifting away from the center because um, uh, we have more working from home. Okay. Now you can debate about a supply elasticity, Henry, right? Of course, but one thing we know for sure: in the short run, supply is elastic. So if demand for central office space and potentially central housing space, if that falls, but the supply is constant, prices are going to fall. If prices fall, right, maybe um, you're going to have some new users who can be successful in bidding for that space. So my question is, what's going to happen with um, the space that becomes available at lower prices as we see the shift in demand towards the suburbs because i do think that it's going to be critical to the uh yeah to the attractiveness of central cities in the long run um what is then going to happen in these spaces can i, can I come in on that the, 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 because i'm interested in other people's views on this um the the one the, i sort of hinted at this at the beginning um I don't know if the demand for central London space falls, right? So hear, hear me out. So, and this is, uh, again, uh, you know, Paul sort of hinted at this with the comments he was making about Prime. If you are a employer shifting to a work from home model where you want people in two to three days a week, you, you, you still need an office location somewhere, right? And my view is, the, the office location you want is probably in central London. Because but you probably don't it, want as much of it, right? Well, okay, so I'll come back to that in a second, right? So I had two points on this. Um, uh, the reason why I say central London, or it could be central Birmingham or central Manchester, uh, is because they give you the largest commuting shed. And so it, if you want to be a hybrid working employer that is attractive to employees, um, then the options of where they can live you know, the more you can give them options, the, the better that will be, right? So I, I actually think you could definitely see um, a consolidation. I mean, why do I, you know, why bother with the expense of having a regional office in Birmingham, right, if you're a London firm? And, uh, uh, why bother having a, you know, you definitely don't want to be, say, South London, which is incredibly difficult to commute to from North London. So I at least think, and I, I think some of the sort of theoretical modeling we've seen over the years probably suggests that this could happen, which says, well, look, you, you drop commuting costs and transaction costs. And I mean, actually, you, you, you get the, 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 the interaction stuff comes into the center of cities. So I, I at least think there's a world where um, the demand for central office space uh, goes up in certain locations. But this comes back to the fact that I think, you know, when, when I was talking to the mayor of the West Midlands, I would be less worried about Birmingham, which is their sort of largest, probably best functioning city, and a hell of a lot more worried about Wolverhampton and commercial in Wolverhampton. Uh, and similarly, you know, I would, I, maybe I worry if I'm Croydon, which already was sort of struggling uh, office market uh, because it wasn't a sort of particularly attractive place for people to be. Um, but actually, if I'm, you know, the mayor of London, I'm all right on the centre. Lindsay, the, 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 the thing I was going to just say, um, I just don't know what's going on with the space at the moment, because the thing, you know, at least while the pandemic is going on, um, people, with the social distancing that, that makes people comfortable being in the office means that you need larger 
uh, amount of floor space per per worker rather than a smaller right uh, but that can't be the the long term right well i don't know i was just sort of distinguishing between mm -hmm. You know, so Gabriel did it for us. He sort of said, well, short term versus long term. I think the, the other offsetting thing, Gabriel, I was going to say on the short term is that if you are going to be in the office at all in the next 18 months, you want more, more space per worker rather than less. So, in fact, I think what we're seeing in central London is lots of firms scrambling around trying to take temporary space um, to, 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 you know, to allow them to have their, their workers more spread out. Yeah, Lindsay, I mean, I agree with you. In the longer run, I don't think that's that that you know maybe that's not so uh but then in the longer run i think the second point that i'm, I'm was making comes starts to come in play you know if firms if firms are thinking about spatial restructuring it's like that uh duranton and puga stories around separating headquarters from manufacturing right i mean the last exactly. time we could separate headquarters from manufacturing big city centers did very well well, now we can almost bring all the headquarter functions into one space and well maybe that Maybe that's good for centre, not not bad. Maybe that even helps business formation if you can afford to, you know, have your headquarters in in London or New York when you couldn't before. Yeah, I, I can't resist, right? I have to I have to chip in. I mean, what what Henry just said is really thought provoking. It's inconsistent with the standard monocentric city model, but it's perfectly in line with the Berlin Wall type of models. So in a in, in a small city, right, which is uh, monocentric and works as one commuting zone, I think that commuting costs clearly is a uh, force that leads to concentration of economic activity in the center. But if the city gets large enough, it can become a dispersion force. At some point, it's just not feasible to bring all the workers into one center. Therefore, we have these emergence of sub-centers and edge cities. Now, as you reduce commuting costs, actually, that force can go away. For the really, really big cities like, like uh, London, right, and, and other mega cities in the world, it can actually mean that you can have a concentration now of economic activity in the city center because the commuting cost is cheaper and it may actually harm sub-centers in those big cities, whereas actually in the smaller cities, right, because the classic monocentric city applies, there you can actually see um, the reduction in commuting costs to be detrimental to the city center as you as you would kind of read that in a textbook model. I think that's a super, super interesting thought. I, I tend, to, I mean, I, I, I agree with something that Henry said very early on, which is, you know, there's an awful lot of uncertainty out there and, and a fair amount of speculation. Uh, but I tend to agree with the, the, the sort of drift that we've been going in in the last uh, three or four minutes. Uh, the possible exception being, you know, places like Oxford Street, the West End is a major retail hub that may become more uh, niche. I don't think it'll disappear, but as a bulk retailer, it may, I, I tend to agree with Lindsay that there are sea changes going on in retailing, which actually predate uh, COVID. But there are also other uh, sea changes that have been going on, including working from home, which happened a long time before COVID, but we've now got enabling technologies that we're more comfortable with and work more effectively. So I'd also like to float again the I idea I'm I, I floated earlier, which is that the real long-term sufferer may be business travel and, uh, air and international airports catering for business travel because people you know, really do cost up the effects of business travel, the costs and the benefits, and you can do a lot more remotely than you used to be able to do. Just uh, jumping in on this, this is something I heard a lot when I was talking to local city officials in the US during the pandemic. I mean, there's a lot of smaller towns or even like substantial sectors of towns that depend on like the hotel industry, right? And they this like part of traveling that comes in through this channel that, that Paul is talking about is a major source of revenue, especially taxes, right? There's this tendency to tax the out-of-towners, right? As a way of generating revenue for a city, right? And if you have less and less of this um, coming from the business traveler it could be a major issue for a lot of city revenues. It could be <clears> have more <throat> digital nomads, right? People who are now free to just um, work from everywhere they want, which doesn't necessarily have to be the suburb of uh, the city they are working in, right? I mean, they may now spend at least parts of the year in places which are attractive places to spend certain uh, periods of the year, at least, right? And just kind of uh, sit in those hotels and do the work from there. I mean, couldn't couldn't that compensate for the- But those really sound coverage? like Hilton Hotel dwellers rather than somebody who's getting sort of a niche Airbnb, right? In a cool, like one-off location. 
that that sounds like that person to me. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, the um, actually, I'm just I'll make a point on this and then and then say something else. Um, I mentioned those footfall numbers. The, the big, the if you try to break down what's happening to London, part of the reason why the shock has been so the COVID shock has been so pronounced is the working from home and the fact that. Uh, we know from Jonathan Dingle and other people's work that, um, you know, the higher skilled you are, the more likely you are to be able to work from home. And London is a high skilled city, right? And you'll see that in sort of cities all over the place. You know, the very high skilled cities are the ones where people have been able to shift to working from home. So the daily footfall from office workers is, is big. But the other, of course, the thing that really hits the London market is the international, uh, is, the, is actually the tourists as well as the travel for work crowd and uh, numbers on both of those are massively down um so i, I think that the, there was let me i mean while, while we're on working from home i'll play a bit devil's advocate here i mean i think do, do, i think it's you can at least construct a reasonable story which some people are which suggests that we see a more radical shift than we're talking about and i I think I probably rule that out, but I think it's at least worth, uh, you know, I'd be interested to see what the, what what you you think about this. So, you know, it looks like the crisis is going to go on longer than people had hoped. Although I'll note that when we were writing that piece in 2020, we said the most reasonable scenario was three to four years based on what we'd seen. So that's not a bad uh, prediction. So the longer the crisis goes on, the more you strengthen beliefs. Uh, about future pandemics, um, th th which have implications for whether people want to be in big, dense environments, right? So I think there's a belief channel that undermines the benefits of agglomeration a little bit. I think uh, long exit gives fir firms much more time to experiment with, uh, with getting working from home, online, retail, et cetera, right? Uh, you know, so if if the first round of vaccines have worked and we we you know and we hadn't had Omicron, you know, when we were out by now, I'd be really confident that we're going back to a reasonably central pause prediction, right? Um, but I think that um, slow exit does give time for experimentation. And you, you the know, one get... fact you didn't mention there, uh, uh, Henry, was like the like structural changes in supply chains. Right. I actually think that in like other sorts of infrastructure changes that could actually be very important. Right. So like part of the reason I think this online retail shock is so persistent is because like Amazon has is just hiring like gangbusters. Right. And building massive warehouses all across the U.S. And like that's not going away. Right. Nor is um, sort of changes to the way that like the U.S. You know, Chinese uh, trading is going on. Right. All the all the new goods we're buying from China. Like, you know, people are making more long term shifts in the supply chain. Yeah, I think I was. I, I think actually, Lindsay, that's an example of the third point I was going to make, which was heading there. No, we do kind of think that 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 large coordinating shocks can shift us to new equilibrium behaviour, right? So, Lindsay, you know, your example there is you suddenly get a ten percent increase uh, in the UK example, right? You you get as much shift to online in a year as you had in a decade. That's a huge boost in the size of the market. Amazon suddenly can afford to incur a huge number of fixed costs in terms of investing in warehouses, et cetera. And then we never go back, right? I mean, that, that shifts us to a position where that, that, that way of, of buying those things becomes uh, dominant. And I guess, you know, this comes back to something that I sort of hinted at earlier. I mean, the, one, the shocks that Paul talked about I don't think we could really reorganize the way we produced stuff. You know, in the 1700s, you still needed to get back into cities. There was no technology that could substitute for that, really. Whereas now, I think some of the people that were are pushing for a, a bigger shift would sort of say, well, look, there are big network externalities to working from home. You know, you, you at the individual firm level, you don't want to be the one that's on the remote call. But if all of us are on the remote call, that's great, right? You know, so, so I, can, I just have some sympathy with the people that say, we're shifting beliefs, we're allowing a lot of experimentation, and we're coordinating firms uh, around a new set of technologies. And those are the three situations, you know, those are three things which we say underpin shifts across 
equilibria, right? So I at least think it's reasonable um, that maybe that could happen. I see Paul smiling, so I'll let him come. Yeah, I, I, you don't convince me, Henry. You don't convince me. Um, I, there was a shift. There was an I didn't interesting... say I really believed it, right? I just said <laughs> I was going to put it out there as... But I just this is a semi joke, but it's it's actually historically factual uh, that if you may not recall, but in 1580 uh, there was a green belt imposed on the city of London, so you weren't allowed to build anything at all within seven miles of the city gates, the walls of the city of London. And one of the really shift effect, effects of the of the Great Fire was that it knocked that on its head, and and the green belt was a that that uh, restriction was abolished. And this is what made the Duke of Grosvenor, as he then became, immensely rich because you were able to develop the West End and Mayfair and Belgravia. So, you know, it can change. I think seismic events can change existing habits of thought to an extent, but they're only long term if they change regulation and, and, and institutions. Now, I'm older than any of the rest of you, so I have lived through many banking crises, for example. And one of the extraordinary things to me is, and indeed real estate crises, how people simply do not learn. Within five years of a crisis, they've forgotten. I see that the Bank of England is already abolishing some of the controls they put on uh, mortgage finance following the, the subprime crash. So, you know, Memories are short. I don't think you'll change beliefs. And I think it's extraordinary how within the five months from the easing of restrictions in May to the end of October, you already actually had retail footfall, not in the center of very center of London, but in the ring around London, above its pre-COVID levels, despite Amazon and all its uh, extraordinary success. And I certainly became a bigger user of Amazon than I have been in the past. Uh, and I noticed on chat there's a point about um, was the change in house prices for large houses in central London, was that something which is London specific? And I think that may be a good point. It's related to the extraordinary income dispersion in London. We have the most unequal distribution of incomes and we have a large number of really seriously rich people, far richer than Henry or myself or even Gabriel. Uh, <laughs> who can afford, whereas in Manchester and, and Birmingham, that isn't. But you may find that you also have that in Paris or in, or in New York, uh, the, the, the super rich buying larger, able to buy larger properties, even in the most expensive districts. But I think that may be a London- My sense in the US is there's been a massive flight to the suburbs. I right? what, so a massive flight to the suburbs in the US, right? It's, it's quite easy in New York, right? To go out to the Hamptons or, you know, Connecticut, right, and buy a massive house with a huge yard and right and still be in a reasonable commuting distance for when you want to be in the city. Sure, but if I was a real estate <laughs> investor, I'd be quite happy to take a punt on some nice uh, apartments in central New York at the moment, Lindsay. I'm not saying that people aren't going to want to live there, right? It's just sort of, you know, there's been a shift. There's been a shift in the balance, right, of, of where people are wanting to live. Well, Lindsay, actually, let me ask you a question because I, I noticed someone had put this in the chat. Um, I mean, you have much more local variation in tax rates um, than we have in the UK. Uh, and someone in the chat asks whether we think that plays a role. I mean, I have to say in the UK, I think not, because if, again, you know, this is back to the fact that just local variation tax rates here is tiny, right? You know, we, we've basically got um, whatever the hell the thing is, not the community. What what's, the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the thing we pay on domestic properties? It's so council it's so, tax this week. Council okay. tax is so inconsequential. I couldn't remember the name of it. Um, but obviously, Lindsay, there's there's much more variation in the US. No, so this is a massive fight in the in the US. So New Jersey, right? It's like has a lot of these New York commuters, but it has some of the highest tax rates in the world, right? And people are these high wealth individuals are trying to get out of New Jersey. That's a, that's a trend that we've been seeing there. And there's a huge fight over how to um, assign taxes based on where you're working, right? If you're if you are all these New York remote workers now. New York is losing a massive amount of revenue, right? For all this, all the taxes they impose on people who work in the city, and so the states are fighting over who actually gets to tax the remote workers based on you know where the headquarters is versus where the worker is, and it's it's not clear who's going to win out here, but the states are definitely fighting over it. 
Mm. Gabriel, do you mind if I jump in and react to something Paul said? No, go ahead, please. That's fine. So actually, I, I think, Paul, your point on regulation is really interesting. So um, w- one of the things I think we're really grappling with on the working from home, right, is, um, you know, there is th- those things I've talked about play in, right? So it's... Um, you know, we've got time to experiment. Maybe it shifted beliefs a little bit. Uh, you know, large scale shocks. You know, I could shift equilibrium or whatever. But again, you know, one of the big discussions that I've been having with government here is um, that they really need to make major regulatory decisions that will govern a, a big part of of, of work. You know, of, of how popular work from home comes. Right. So, you know, lots of people in the the government at the moment are massively worrying about whether, uh, you know, commercial central commercial areas come back. And I say, yeah, you know, I mean, that's fine to worry about that. But like ultimately, well, we are where we are. You know, I'm not sure that you, you know, there'll be distribution implications to that. But, you know, maybe you want to let it play out because presumably we think we're probably shifting to a better equilibrium if flexibility comes in. But the thing I do say to them is that who's thinking about what regulations will govern working from home? You know, if you think about what we've done in terms of worker rights, um, all the, the, the vast bulk of regulation that we've had around worker rights still assumes that we're going in to an office environment. Right. So, you know, the working hours directive, uh, you know, which is the U- European Union thing, which uh, restricts wages, uh, restricts working hours. Well, you know, when the boundary between what, what's work and what's home, th- that actually becomes much more about uh, the right to unplug. For example, right, and we, we're sort of nowhere on that. I mean, we see this from sort of people's behavior. behavior. Um, what will governments do about people who want to work flexibly when their firm feels they can't? I, I, you know, there's there's a huge sort of the British government is toying with this at the moment, whether or not we allow people to work flexibly. One of my favorite things here, by the way, back to my point about option values, has been watching all of those tech firms who uh, early on in the crisis said, you'll be able to work from anywhere with an asterisk saying <laughs> exceptions apply. Now desperately pointing to the exceptions apply and saying, we want you all back in the office. Right, and Google is buying up space in central London. <laughs> so there we go. I mean, they're, they're the leading ones that jumped early and then have been busy unraveling that. Right. But, you know, again, I mean, uh, what we'll do about about childcare provision, you know, a lot of childcare provision is is geared around people needing to do it uh, in a way that is consistent with them going into work. What we'll do about, um, you know, one of the major problems we've been grappling with is everyone getting injured at working from home, you know, because <laughs> all the sort of all the sort of uh, things around, you know, checking your work environment is suitable and all the stuff, it's all uh, based around being in work. So I am actually kind of with Paul. I do actually think that, and now I've done it there on a different thing, well, obviously, because really, I think the major thing, Paul, is regulations around land use and zoning, etc. Right? I mean, no, I no, regula- you're thing. right. No, no, and and and, and if it's going, but but part part of that, Henry, is predicated on working from home becoming more of a norm than it even has, and that is, I think, still you know out for out for argument to the extent to which that will happen. I think it's a, an increase. It has been an increasing trend. It's been accelerated by COVID, but I think it will quite likely not carry on for, for at the same rate of accelerate, may even go back a bit over the next 10 years. Um, but I did notice a case, I think, in Germany, where someone sued their employer because they broke their leg getting out of bed to get to the uh, to their workstation at home. Uh, and that was regarded, that was uh, decided to be an industrial injury. Uh, so, so it's already a topic that's being grappled with. Right, it's very interesting. A hand up. I see a hand up from Carl. Exactly, right. I mean, that was why I was about to say that. I mean, we are kind of approaching the end of our session. So I think we should take a chance to take the last questions also from the audience. Carlos, your hand has been up for a while. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, please? Carlos, are you still around? Uh, not really. I think that seems to be a legacy hand. There was another question in the chat. Okay. The- I had to flick across to just check the news story that the, the interest rates have gone up. 
Um, do we have a view on that? Okay, one of you is more macro than me. I mean, clearly that's being driven by things that Lindsay mentioned. I mean, the, everywhere is having a cost of living uh, issue. Uh, it is really not being helped in the UK by the fact that we've managed to compound that with putting the COVID shock on top of the Brexit shock. Uh, I mean, the, the, all the evidence out of that we're seeing out of CEP, uh, we published something this week on it says, you know, the, the supply chain crisis uh, and the issues caused by uh, foreign workers leaving are a major issue uh, in, in adding to the additional inflationary pressures. But I have no view on what it will do to the commercial and resi markets. Not a lot, I would suspect, if we're talking about the difference between 0.1 and 0.25. But Paul and Lindsay and Gabriel, you might have different view. Well, yeah, you go ahead, Paul. Uh, well, I mean, uh, the other thing that one has thrown into that mix in terms of the residential market is the, re you know, the fact that stamp duty tax has come back. I mean, that's quite a, a hefty charge on mobility and on transactions in the housing market. And it, one of the factors which differentiate, differentially influenced the increase in the price of more expensive houses relative to cheaper ones, because it's a bigger hit on more expensive houses. And I think in the short term, that's more, I mean, it's a very small change in the interest rate. Uh, the interest rate has been at uh, incredibly low historic rates for longer than I could possibly have anticipated, I have to say. But the uh, Fed is talking about like, you know, three rate hikes in 2022, right? So I don't really think we're talking about just like a half or, you know, a yeah, quarter that, point. Yeah, we're yeah. talking about yeah, I mean, the Fed is talking about 3%, I think, over the next 18 <clears throat> months, something like that. But even that, you know, given that we've got inflation at 5% in this country, and it's pretty high in the US as well, you know, we're still in negative real interest rate territory. Yep, I agree. One thing I so, will say about, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think I'm that, I mean, we are reaching really the point where we um, need to conclude our discussion, right, so that we do not stretch. I mean, the, uh, okay, but Carlos has finally managed to ask his question. So maybe uh, moving on, that's a question about retail. Uh, Lindsay, do you want to address this, this question? I haven't had a chance to read it. To uh... Uh, so there's a question about retail parks. Uh, malls, malls, I guess, in American malls. What's the view of what malls? do you think is going to happen to malls? <laughs> I, th I think, uh, I think, well, so there's an interesting divergence, I think, be between like the US and the UK in terms of, of uh, this kind of retail space, because it's been the case for decades that uh, mall, that kind of uh, space has been way oversupplied in the US, right? So we have this phenomenon, I don't know how much it's hitting place in the UK, of just like zombie malls happening over the last two decades as, as online retail rises. I think that's going to definitely continue to be an issue, especially in less accessible areas, but whether or not, you know, malls can shift to being a more experiential um, uh, set of set of offerings, right? So like, you know, like the Lewisham Shopping Center, I love to, to talk about in my uh, case study for, for class, right? That's a Southeast London uh, near like a good transportation, it's got like good population density, like the more that that, that sort of space can shift to being, um, you know, restaurants and cafes and other reasons that people come in, you know, not just, not just to do, you know, um, uh, the kinds of goods that were going to be bought more on, online, those kinds of spaces will will do better, but I do not think that, like in general, the shopping malls are, are looking good. All right, that's a very concrete answer. I think we can uh, leave it there. So I think let's, we should be coming to an end, right, because we are kind of um, running over time, but I do want to finish with one last question to you guys, because this came up during um, this discussion. So the big takeaway that I'm going um, uh, home here um, from this discussion is that as long as we're just talking about um, accelerated technological change, we are not expecting big cities to die. There could even be kind of groupman-like um, uh, surprising responses in the core periphery structure that run counter the, to the intuition in line with what we've seen in the past, that reductions in transport costs and communication costs actually have led to agglomeration. But the other thing that came up is that you all felt like, okay, but if this pandemic just goes long enough, there's going to be an update of the belief um, that the pandemic is going to be a permanent state. And if this happens, then I think the prediction is pretty unambiguous that um, there's going to be the Henry Overman big city exodus. So my question to you guys as a final statement, how long is this um, when we reach that point? How long does the uh, pandemic have to last for us to believe that this is going to be something that is persistent and is going to have a catastrophic effect on big cities in years? Lindsay. What's your feeling? Wow, don't I feel like the lesson of the last like five years is don't make predictions like this. Um, 
but I, I think the important part is that like, you know, the more the things go on, the more you have like more people making, like more marginal people making readjustment choices, right? As they like people graduating college or people getting their first job or buying their first house, right? They're, they're making these big fixed costs, right? And that becomes uh, like a sclerosis in the system to return to a, to a previous uh, equilibrium. I mean, the Omicron thing, right, has really drawn, uh, like thrown a wrench in the a spanner, a spanner in the works, right? So, you know, the, it, I don't know, are we gonna have these kinds of things happening, you know, every winter, right? For the next, you know, three to four years, right? I think I was talking to Henry yesterday, thinking like, you know, actually are we in the middle of this? I think, you know, if this if this goes on for another three years, right? I think that that could push us definitely towards that kind of uh, big city issue equilibrium. Henry, what's your take? Three to four years? Is that going to be enough? What doomsday prediction? Um, no, but I'm. I think I'm going to be with Paul here. I think three to four years, uh, you start to see some really big medium term shifts. I still think long term there'll there'll be adaptation. So I just, I just think that it really does become quite a severe crisis if it goes three to four years. But I still think that that is a medium term effect, not necessarily a long run. I think there is lots of technological change to come that would uh, allow uh, urban environments to uh, adapt. I, not least, for example, I just think they could become places which, uh, where people like Paul and I have to move out, but people like you and Lindsay are perfectly fine. <laughs> I tell you something, Henry. I'm not moving out. <laughs> Paul, is there is there any any limit, right? I mean, if this goes, no, I mean, I think it's interesting. You see, we're, we're going from the youngest to the middling to the oldest. So I've been around longest. I remember cholera. You know, so for th you were there for the black death. Years, <laughs> two thousand years, the death rate in cities was higher than the birth rate. And they only grew from rural urban migration. People <laughs> lived with appalling conditions in cities for 2000 years. It's only since the late 19th century that we've got sanitation in cities. So, you know, I just don't conceive of a world where the pandemic becomes sufficiently bad, given that it's actually a pretty mild pandemic by historic standards, to close down cities or really have these fundamental effects on, on beliefs and beliefs shorter. The only thing that I would say is I do think that we haven't really talked about it much, but Henry mentioned it right at the beginning. I do see this divergence. I think the superstar cities are likely to be the ones where we get the biggest recovery and quicker and do relatively much better. And London, I'm glad to say, is a superstar city, even though it's been bashed by Brexit and that has quite a significant effect. Right, so I think this is a good uh, good time uh, to end. We are, we are reassured by Paul with all his internal wisdom of his long life that cities are more resilient than we think. I think that means we should keep our investments in big and growing cities. That is personally for me, of course, very reassuring. Um, with this, I suggest that uh, we end this exciting session. I hope you guys enjoyed kind of seeing academics talking to each other, the way they talk, contradicting each other, learning from each other. And um, yeah, maybe that's the slightly um, uh, kind of uh, frustrating part. I mean, it, it works actually pretty well on Zoom, but I still hope that we um, uh, go back to doing this in the real world sometime soon. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think, uh, Lois, from my side, we can close the session. Um, uh, uh, you may feel free to end the session anytime you want.